Good morning, Revolution. Everybody, and welcome to Good our morning. show this morning. Uh, Rosanna, Michael, Anita, and uh, Taryn. Scott. Scott is here. I'm here too. Good morning, Revolution. Good morning. Good morning, Good morning everybody. Good morning. So um, we got a lot to talk about this week. A lot's been happening. Uh, the war is continuing. Into the second week, the price of gas is up, 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 up and away. And a not so beautiful balloon. And uh, what else? Uh, we also have questions uh, from our listening and reading office. And then we're going to talk a little bit about cryptocurrency. I heard a kryptonite, uh, but up until recently, this <laughs> cryptocurrency thing is a new. And so we have an expert this evening, Taryn is with us, who's going to help us uh, understand the political economy, uh, the economics of crypto, cryptocurrency. So let's get started. Scott, uh, you know, I, I know you're very close to your homeboy, Joe Biden, but inflation is off the charts. Is it, is it Biden's fault? It's the ruling class's fault. It's, you know, this is, um, and in the first in the first place, the, the price of gas, which is um, increasing, as you mentioned, at an insane uh, rate, um, really a hard hit for, for working people who rely on, you know, cars to commute because we don't have good public transit. Um, this is, this whole idea that, you know, in service of democracy, we have to, um, you know, cut off Russia as a, like, you know, as a, as an oil and, and gas exporter. And we have to, you know, wait for the U S to step up and fill the gap. And in that time, prices are going to go way up. It's bullshit, right? It's, it's a way, it's a call to funnel profits to U S oil and gas companies. Um, and that's, that's all it is. They are the ones that are um, standing to profit most from this, from this war. Well, I did notice that you didn't object to me calling Biden your homeboy. So at least we got that well, part. I'm, right. I'm on. I'm well, on. Taryn Biden does have some control over supply and demand. He opened up the reserves. Isn't that a good thing? Can you shed some light on the subject? Well, I mean, because the price of oil is so high right now, it's going to incentivize a lot of domestic fracking and a lot of domestic uh, oil production. And I don't think that's a good thing, actually. I think that's terrible for the environment. I feel like, you know, just last year, Joe Biden was talking about how important it was for us to get off of oil through this Green New Deal that they had on the table. And now all of a sudden, it's like a complete heel turn. It's like a 180 degree thing because it's like, actually, we love oil and gas. And, and you know, we want to, to start opening up domestic production again. I think that that's bad. I think it's not only bad for the environment. I think that it's uh, bad in terms of getting off of oil and gas. Is it going to lower the price? Perhaps. But yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't like it. I don't like domestic oil production. <laughs> but Rosanna, it is good for Venezuela. They're talking about now you know, better relations, so let's, and maybe even not better political relations, but hey, you know, when the going gets tough, the yeah. tough get going, it's and tough. let's do some economic trade with, uh, yeah. with the government. All of a sudden, uh, they're friends, you know, oh, you know, let's talk. All of a sudden, they're not so bad. You know, all of these things, it just shows the hypocrisy of capitalism and capitalist um, and I, I don't believe the prices of gas are going to go down. Once those prices are are there, you know, it just means more profit. Even if even if they pay less for oil, there's you know, five dollar a gallon is just horrifying. But for the companies, it's profit. So they're not going to they're not you know it's not going to go down. Anita, in the uh, uh, meeting of the national board. I said, I'm afraid that the election is going to turn on the price of gas. Am I right or wrong? I hope uh, I hope you're wrong about that, uh, Joe. And I think there are some things that people could do to alleviate it. For once, I think uh, I think this is the first time in in years I I see the Ohio legislature about to do something that I agree with, which is roll back 
gas taxes, which are very regressive, uh, the poor pay more. And they're also uh, taking away the people who have electric cars get a $200 penalty fee to pay every year because of the gas tax that they're not paying. So they're gonna roll that back too. So at least, I mean, that it's working people that are hardest hit uh, by the gas tax. Another thing municipalities are doing is they're talking about having free uh, public uh, transportation, just making the bus system free. We had that in Columbus for a while during the pandemic. And I think that would change people's minds about, uh, you know, jumping on the bus instead of taking their cars everywhere. You know, in my hometown, people don't like to take the bus, you know, it's just, just like this really pejorative thing about taking the bus. And it really doesn't, I'm not, you know, Youngstown is such a, you know, all of the shopping is in the suburbs and in, in, in the city there's really not much so you know i'm not sure how much that would help you know i mean it would help a little bit if you but i'm not sure uh, uh, how much so michael what's your take am i right or wrong uh, uh the election is going to turn on the price of gas you know i think I hope you're wrong, but I think you're right. <laughs> and I think um, if the Democrats were smart, you know, they would um, act on some of these proposals that Biden made in his State of the Union speech, um, you know, on voting rights uh, and something that he promised in his campaign run, which was a student debt forgiveness. There's a great article that went up on the uh, party website this week talking about how we need to organize around uh, student debt. You know, that's easy to forgive. He can do it, you know, and he promised that $10,000 to begin with. And, you know, that was certainly, uh, he would be certain uh, the Democrats would be able to maintain the youth vote, which they did in 2020. I think they had about 60%, uh, which voted for Biden. And so I, I think gas is going to have a lot to do with it, but there's other factors. I think voting rights, student debt, unemployment, um, the pandemic coming to an end and how people react to that, I think it'll have a lot to do with it. You know, but people don't vote. Most people, students don't vote in the midterms, you know. Voter turnout is low anyway. Aren't the uh, people who we want to target, Scott, during the midterms are those who vote and leave the rest to whoever you want to leave it to? That, that's that's no longer a viable strategy. I, I think there, there are probably, you know, uh, a lot of people promoting that, but it's not a viable strategy anymore. Um, you've mentioned before, Joe, you know, the example of Georgia and the huge efforts around registration and, and turnout um, in, in the 2020 elections. And, and that has to be the model, I think, for, you know, for, for all elections um, going forward. Uh, we can't, like, I, I think there's this fantasy shared by a section of the ruling class, including um, the Biden and his administration, um, that this war is going to be some kind of a uniting factor, right? That this is going to bring together, you know, uh, moderate Republicans and most of uh, most Democrats into this great sort of national unity in favor of the fight against authoritarianism and and whatever other bullshit thing. Um, but that's that's not going to work. That's just going to push us further down the road to uh, to the right. Um, so it it has to be. I, I think I agree with Michael. We. Um, the, the way forward has to be uh, voting rights, student debt forgiveness, and, and building um, a coalition that can actually move the Democratic Party forward. Um, I mean, if we're interested in moving the Democratic Party forward, which is not particularly- I'm interested in moving democracy forward, the <laughs> Democratic Party to the extent that, I mean, it's about democracy. It's about working class and people's power. It's about, Terrence, it's about lowering the goddamn price of gas. So I, 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 I asked you this question before, why can't Biden and the Congress just put a, either a price freeze on the price of gas or a rollback? Well, I don't know if you've been reading the news lately, but the big oil has a lot of power and they're really pushing it around right now from, you know, the gas pump prices and their record profits to what's going on in Europe, around Ukraine. Um, you know, big oil is a pretty powerful enemy to go up against. I think that ever since I've been an adult, I, I think every single war has been over oil. So... I think you'd have to take on the big oil companies. And I don't know if uh, Joe Biden is, is ready to do that. 
objectively speaking, though, let's would freezing or rolling back the price of gas help or hurt? That's the question I'm asking. Oh, I mean, I think it would help. I just don't think it can happen at this point. Because big oil is too powerful. Exactly. Well, yeah. Um, okay. Let's switch gears a little bit and talk about the war itself. Uh, who's in flavor? Flavor. Who is in favor of the newest flavor of the week, which is a no freaking fly zone over the Ukraine? Put up your hands if you are. Uh, nobody's putting up their hand. Insane Rosanna, people. Uh, Ros Rosanna, no fly zone, yes or no? No. And why? We have to stop all this nonsense and get to the table and talk. And talk. It's just, you know, I, I'm just not for it. I think it's a provocation too. It can be a provocation and just a, an excuse to, you know, to go in there. Because <clears throat> they're talking I mean, about nuclear just... war when they 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 want they're. And, and then they want they want MIGs. What is a MIG anyway? It's a special kind of aircraft. But, um, the, and then they wanted Poland to give web, their planes to the Ukraine. And, um, and, and they already said that these Eastern European countries that, that join NATO, if the Russian army approaches them, then they have that special retaliation paragraph in the NATO doctrine, Scott, uh, and they're going to treat it like a, a combined attack and there's going to be, what, nuclear war? This, this is, this, yeah, this is insane. I mean, the, the, the level of risk that um, the, the working classes of the entire world at this point are being subjected to um, because primarily of the demand of of, of fossil fuel companies for access to markets in Europe is incredible. Um, Russia has the world's largest nuclear arsenal. We have the world's second largest. Um, and yet, you know, I, I just saw an article, I, I believe it was in the New Yorker, uh, maybe the New York Times, one or the other, I can't remember. Uh, the, the title of it was um, how removing a few screws allowed uh, the Pentagon to ship Stinger missiles to Ukraine without uh, revealing classified information, like uh, gloating about, you know, how, how about pouring fuel on this, on this fire. This is an incredibly dangerous situation. Um, and already, you know, working class people have been asked to sacrifice in terms of gas prices, in, in terms of, of course, in, 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 in Russia and Ukraine, in terms of uh, political repression in terms of the, the um, humanitarian cost of, of invasion. Um, too much. I'm, I'm with Rosanna. This needs to stop. And peace is possible. Peace is necessary. And it starts with NATO and the U.S. in first place dropping its bullshit and, um, and letting the uh, diplomatic process happen. Okay, let's, let's take some questions from the field of political practice, because these are not just theoretical issues. They also impinge directly on our ability to put pressure on the Biden administration. Now, we know that some of our comrades across the country were organizing demonstrations, organized them in Columbus and Cincinnati and Cleveland, and I'm stuck in Ohio and in Michigan and in Detroit and in Indiana. And, and one of the things that happened, y'all, was that the coalitions that were formed, some of them, there was a splitting issue. They said no war, everybody agreed with no war, but then they raised the issue of should, uh, one of the sub demands was no expansion to NATO. And some of the forces in the, who were aligned with the Democrats said, no, we're not for, we're for ending the war. We support Rosanna. They should sit down at the table to talk. They should have a ceasefire. But when it comes to uh, expanding NATO, we're not going to agree to that. So if you don't drop that, we're not going to be part of your coalition. 
uh, Anita, should they have agreed to jettison no NATO expansion? No, I think no NATO is, a, is just a key demand that we have to, uh, not, not no NATO, maybe what no expansion of NATO, I think is a really fair demand that I know, um, I, I understand the Alliance for Global Justice has this list of demands about the war and that was one of them. And I just think, you know, that's a basic thing. And if people are not agreeing with that, then they need more education about what NATO is in the world and how militarization and, and you know, finance capital all are, you know, bonded together. So I think, um, you know, I think we, we, have to, we have to educate our allies as well as, um, you know, to bring them on board. Michael, people need education, but the no-fly zone is still being debated. I was listening to the Republicans, oh, hell yeah, give them MIGs, enforce a no-fly zone. They're under a lot of pressure. And isn't it more important to, to broaden the coalition right now than to get into this whole big debate around expanding NATO? Shouldn't, shouldn't Anita and them have dropped that demand I mean, is either that a nuclear incineration? I'm thinking about um, Lenin has a chapter in Left Wing Communism and Infantile Disorder about compromises. In fact, the chapter is called No Compromise? Question mark, and he talks about making uh, principled compromises. You know, and so I think in the in the in the sense of NATO, I think Anita is correct. I think that's something you can't budge on because NATO is <laughs> a big factor and the start of all this war. Yes, Russia invaded, but you know, Ukraine put its application in for both NATO and uh, uh, NATO and the European Union while it was bombing the two people's republics, you know, and so of course the fly zone and the sanctions, that's not going to help anything. That's only going to make the Russian people suffer. They don't deserve to suffer. Those are working people and we're for ending sanctions. And sanctions have never worked before, right? The United States says, oh, we implement these sanctions so that these authoritarian regimes fall, Cuba, Venezuela, Iran, but those regimes are still in power, you know, after all these decades. So is it truly working from the perspective of the United States? You would think they would, you know, learn a lesson or two. So no, they have to drop the, the no-fly zone. They have to drop the sanctions uh, because Russia will just go elsewhere with its business. In fact, I read um, a headline this morning. It was a quote from Putin saying, uh, the Soviet Union fell, but not because of sanctions. And I thought that was quite interesting. Yeah. I can just feel the nuclear flames you know, on my heels. Rosanna, I mean, the, the, the problem isn't the issue. Who is talking about expanding NATO? There is no demand right now to expand NATO. I mean, that's a whole lot of talk. Shouldn't they, Anita and Michael's hardline, no NATO posture be softened a little bit in order to broaden the coalition? Um, I'm not really sure. I mean, I think if it's going to bring some unity so that maybe down the road they can discuss, you know, that can be discussed and maybe perhaps people can be convinced by working together that then, yeah, perhaps like it could be softened. But hold on, Joe. What do you mean by there's no talk of expanding NATO? There's no um, talk of it. Well, what's happening is, is that it there Ukraine. is a de facto, what they're calling, what we're calling a de facto NATOization of Ukraine. They've pulled back on the issue of bringing Ukraine into NATO formally, but they're doing it uh, actually. By right? Trump started it. So, and, 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 and so well, this formal issue of, you know, dropping the demand is. Kind of a uh... except that the the thing that that um, Russia identified as its key demand long before any forces crossed the border, uh, the key demand in any peace negotiations was a commitment that NATO that um, Ukraine would not be admitted into NATO. Yes. Um, so, and I, I think that you know, insofar as that's a you know a recognized like plank of what Russia sort of requires to come to the table, um, saying that we can't commit to, uh, you know, we're not ready to, to, to say that NATO shouldn't expand. I, yeah, I'm but with- Karen, uh, it's a red herring. 
nobody's raising that they, they, they should come into NATO. We're not. Why are you making a big deal about that? Nobody is saying anything about that now. About NATO expansion? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're not, we're not making that demand. You, you, you're asking me to agree to something that I'm not even putting on the table. I mean, right. yeah, back in 2014, we raised it. But now, it's eight years later, time has passed. We're not. So why is, why is this, why, why, why are y'all so rigid on this issue of NATO? Well, no, nobody is. Well, I mean, I think that, you know, we should talk about, uh, to go back to what we were saying earlier with gas prices, it's like, I didn't vote for all of these billions of dollars to get spent on NATO to go to war. Um, and I think that that's like a really valid thing to talk about is that maybe we shouldn't be spending all this money on war. Um, it's sort of a 180, like I said, we, we wanted to have new green infrastructure that's gonna help save the planet. And now instead, like a year later, it's we're gonna have a war that might possibly incinerate the planet. So I, I just feel like if we can push it a little bit more towards why is it that we're spending all this money and effort right now on Eastern Europe when things here are not doing so hot, you know, I feel like that's a really good strategy to have. But I'm I'm all for like, you know, abolishing NATO at this point. I don't know, depending on the crowd that you're talking to, maybe you wanna you want to temper that language. But I think it's an important conversation to have with people. Like, what is NATO for? How much do we spend on NATO every year? Is this really going to be helping the working class, either in the United States or in Ukraine or in Russia? True or false, Scott? Russia invaded Ukraine. And it was not justified. Hello? Yeah. You cannot reduce this war to a single true or false statement, Joe. That's not an analysis. Look, you you know, we said to Trump's, uh, what, what was the woman who was the spokesperson, the strategist for Trump that's married to the lawyer who said, uh, we have our alternate facts. Kellyanne Conway. Kellyanne Conway. We said, Kellyanne, you can't have your own facts. The fact of the matter is that Ukraine, the Russia invaded the U Ukraine and the Communist Party leadership said it was wrong. Didn't we say that, Scott? Yeah. And okay. we also said that the uh, de facto NATOization, the NATO occupation of Ukraine uh, was wrong and was a provocation. Um, and that- But they, that it didn't justify the invasion. And neither, so these, this is every Communist war, Party in the world Except the Russian Communist Party has said that. Uh, the Syrian Every Communist single Party. one, huh? The Syria, the United Communist Party of Syria. Um, they has, agree with the Russians. Okay, I that's two, so. that's two to 133. I mean, last count, because you know, sometimes you get these communist parties that are created, no nobody, <laughs> these no names. I'm unclear as to what you're where you're sort of, what you're asking us here, Joe. I'm asking us to recognize that you might want to soften your position in order to stop the bombs from uh, exploding so that the no-fly zone will be halted so that you can take a breath and have a conversation about peace. And I'm saying that you know, when you're at loggerheads and everybody is shouting at each other and screaming and, and dropping bombs and throwing left hooks and right hooks and bazookas and shooting at each other with AKs and AR-15s and all the modern weaponry, that is craziness. And somebody needs to take a step back and breathe so that peace can be, give peace a chance. Anita. Yeah. You want to I, reconsider your position? Uh, no, not really. Um, I, I, I think we, um, let's see if I can get my thoughts straight here. Um, I, I really think we, we should um, still say no expansion of NATO. And, it, you know, numerous people are marching against this war. I would, though, agree with that statement that Russia invaded Ukraine and it wasn't justified. I would say that. I would agree with that because I think going in and killing women and children and you know men and and people uh, or 
destroying property. I just think it's a wrong thing to do. It's a wasteful, it's waste of resources that could be spent otherwise. So, um, so I would agree with that, but, but still, I think, um, you know, there is expansion of NATO. I don't think it, it, it should be, you know, I, I think he needs to, Putin and Russia and the Russian people need to win an idea uh, battle, not, not, a, not a, a hot one, so. And, and the other thing is that we're not citizens of Russia. Um, we are citizens of the United States. Our main struggle, our responsibility is to work for peace and democracy in our own country and to present, you know, the most powerful um, front for peace and for democracy um, to put pressure on the ruling class forces of, of this country. Um, if softening our language on NATO can make that happen. Um, perhaps it's worth consideration. I, I, don't, I don't think that it will. Um, uh, and especially not being drawn into the, um, the sort of um, nationalistic backlash that's, that's fueling this sort of very emotional response to everything. All, all this sort of, you know, photos of, um, you know, the, the, the suffering people of Ukraine splashed a law across all the newspapers. Yes, it's horrible. It's a humanitarian tragedy. It was an unjustified uh, invasion, um, but, that, but NATO shares, uh, to my understanding, as much of the blame for that as, uh, as Russia. Um, Here's what I'm saying. It's a fake issue. The issue is right now, the United States government and military sending arms to Ukraine. That's the issue. They should be sending there's no, the there's no formal, the Trump started it. Trump started sending arms and Biden continued it. So our demand comrades has to be, and Tom Scott is right. We, we, we're responsible for the peace movement in this country. And therefore we need to say to Mr. Biden as our statement, the first sentence and it says, we need to change that policy. And what's the policy? Sending arms to the Ukraine government. That has to be our demand. And let's not get caught up in these, you know, planks that, I mean, that's a plank for the Russian government. Okay, that's fine for them. But for us, it has to be stop sending arms, um, in my opinion. Let's move the conversation because uh, we're running out of time. But before we go, one of the uh, big issues that has come up last week has been cryptocurrency. I don't even know what that is. I said at the start of this, I heard a kryptonite that is that chemical, that element from the planet Krypton that makes Superman weak. But they say cryptocurrency is making the economy strong. Taryn, what is it and, and uh, what impact is it having on this whole debate? Um, well, cryptocurrency is basically electronic money um, that isn't that doesn't go through banks. Right. So usually if I want to send somebody money on Venmo or, um, you know, through a, a Zelle or some other program on my phone, it's going from my bank account to another person's bank account. Ultimately, cryptocurrency, generally speaking, because there are thousands of different types of cryptocurrency, um, so I can't speak for all of them. Uh, but generally, it goes from one person's wallet to another person's wallet. It's it's easy to think of it more like cash as opposed to using your debit card for something because it's allegedly supposed to be a secret transaction, but it's not a secret transaction. That's what most people don't understand. Um, I think that cryptocurrency is horrifying. I think that its emergence definitely signals a changing nature in the global economy. And I think it also underscores tensions between um, states and more like libertarian kinds of, of, of 
thinkers, I guess. And I think that one of the reasons why it's been in the news so much recently, because it's been around since, I guess, like 2012 or so, um, or no, sorry, it's been around a little bit longer than that. I think maybe 2011 was when they started Bitcoin. Either way, the, the thing is, is that it's it's not good. It's not good. And I think that what they what the reason why it was in the news is because people are using cryptocurrency to send money to fighters in Ukraine right now. Uh, yeah. I heard that uh, it, the Taliban, not the Taliban, but ISIS is going there to fight too. Is that how they're financing them? Did you read anything about that? I didn't read anything about ISIS being financed in Ukraine um, by cryptocurrency, but I know that it is like a popular way of trying to send money that can circumvent states. Um, I think it's all in the eye of the beholder. I think it's easy for like the CIA, for instance, to use money to, or sorry, use cryptocurrency to send money uh, to certain groups in Ukraine. But I think that for countries that are suffering under sanctions, um, it's much more difficult for them to do that. Because like I said, it's sort of anonymous to who. If you've got enough of the big computers on your side, it's not hard to figure out who's getting paid from what wallet. Um, but I don't think that they're very interested in doing it that when they, when it comes to funding you know, terrorists in Ukraine. Thank you. We'll keep our eye yeah, on quick it. Question, we'll Terry. Back to it as uh, our... Uh, ongoing coverage of the war in the Ukraine uh, continues. Scott, I'm sorry, but we have to wrap up. Okay. Uh, Michael, upcoming events. We have a, a webinar on trans women's equality coming up. What day, what time, how can people see it? That'll be on March 20th at uh, 7 p.m. Eastern time, and you can sign up on cpusa.org or on any of our social media. We've uh, posted about it, advertised it, and it's our way to celebrate um, trans women leading the struggle for not just you know trans women's rights, but also for the rights for the overall LGBTQ community and workers as a whole. And so it's very important, and it's a groundbreaking event, and we're very excited for it. So we'll see you then, March 20th at 7 p.m. And also because the Republican right is making it a wedge issue and they're, they're passing laws discriminating against trans people and we're not having it. And therefore we have to raise our consciousness about this issue and demand complete equality for everybody, including trans women um, and trans men also for that matter. So uh, stay strong, stay safe, Stay in the fight. Uh, we'll be back next week with a new edition of Good Morning Revolution. Take care, everybody. Take Bye. care. Bye, comrades. Bye. Bye.